Welcome to the Veritas Forum, engaging university students and faculty in discussions about life's hardest questions and the relevance of Jesus Christ to all of life. It's a great joy for me to be here tonight. The first thing I want to say is that I had one of my proudest scientific and ethical discoveries a few weeks ago with Brian, and I was having dinner at his house, and I was just so excited to share this with him. And, uh, you know, Brian just got married um, last year, coming up on his first year anniversary, and I walked in and I said, Brian, I've got to tell you something. Can we go in your bathroom? I've got to show you something. And, and his wife looked at me really strangely, and I said, I figured out a way to get all the toothpaste out of a tube. Now, some of you may live with somebody who does this to a tube of toothpaste. I'm the person that hates this, right? But they've come up with this new way to figure it out, and it's quite easy. You just use the edge of a solid surface, like your bathroom counter, and you just run it down there. It's so simple. But look at how the tube, it's, it's so elegant and simple. You don't need a special device. You don't need a clothespin. You just need your kitchen sink. And isn't, isn't that amazing? You get all the tooth, and it's scientific and it's ethical right there. So um, thank, you, thank you very much. Um, I just say it's a really, it's a joy for me to be here at the um, Veritas Forum. Uh, 13 years ago, I was a, as a fourth year what you call seniors here at Emory, at UVA, I was about to graduate, and I went to my first Veritas Forum, and it was on something like we're talking about tonight. And I can't remember anything specifically from that event, but what I do remember is being challenged to pursue my Christian faith and to pursue intellectually the science that I do as one pursuit, not as two separate things, not that I was like this twin that I had to figure out how to communicate with myself. That they were the same thing and they could be the same thing. That was Cal DeWitt, um, professor and an ecologist at the University of Wisconsin, who's now become a friend of mine. So the Veritas Forum has been very important in my own life. And I know that if you're an undergraduate, or even if you're a graduate student or beyond, um, and I'm teaching my classes here at Emory, I know these questions that I was wrestling with 13 years ago are very close to the forum. And I'll try to address these tonight. But just some basic questions like, what is good work? Not just what is a smart thing to do or what kind of job can I pursue to make some money or to make my parents proud, but what's good work? Um, where in society do I do that work? Do I work in a hospital? Do I work in local government? Do I raise a family? Do I go to work for the church? Do I work for a corporation? Do I go to the university? Where do I do this good work? And then lastly, whom are my coworkers? If I really take this Christianity thing really seriously, does that mean I don't work with atheists? Does that mean I don't work with agnostics? Or if I'm an atheist, do I even talk to Christians? Can I take them seriously? So these are the kinds of things that the forum, in broad sense, tries to develop. And they're important questions I think a lot of university undergraduates. Universities are places where you can ask these questions. I'm not sure you always get the best answers, but we're going to try to address some of this stuff tonight. So. Firstly, this works, this is an amazing device. Um, I want to talk a little bit about what I do. I study extinction. Uh, my job is to understand and prevent extinction. Is there a way that we could dim some of these lights in here to make that a bit more visible? We had it really well earlier when I was setting up. Kind of does this spotlight thing on me. Not that that's the intent. <laughs> But it's a byproduct we'll have to live with for the next little bit of time. So this is a picture of a place I'm actually going to be living in a few months. This is the Hawaiian Islands, um, moving there in June. And uh, this is a place, this is kind of the epicenter of extinction in the world right now. Not just in the United States, that's the one. That's the one. I think that, that shows it up a bit better. Um, Hawaii is the epicenter of extinction. My work is to understand and prevent extinction. And so I do that in a number of ways. And how I came about this was growing up, uh, my grandfather was a farmer and I spent a lot of time out at his farm. And most of my first ecological lessons were with him. They weren't in a classroom. They were running around his farm learning about why the hickory trees down in the gullies by the streams had larger hickory nuts than the ones up in the hills because they had more water, right? As an ecologist, we call that a riparian zone. That's not what he called it. He called the 
the good hickory trees, right? <laughs> um, but that was an important ecological lesson. And he is the person who taught me about valuing creatures and understanding them and that being a Christian pursuit. Uh, another thing happened that was really formative for me was when I was in university, a friend of mine was sexually assaulted and I joined a peer education group on sexual assault uh, just to sort of understand about it. I didn't know anything about it and she was an important person to me to try to help her in that process. And I was shocked to discover that I was the only person remotely, demographically, politically, or religiously like myself in this group. And I wondered, how come there are no Christians in this group? Clearly, women and sexual assault and the safety of your sisters and your mothers is something we should be concerned about. This isn't a Christian issue, but there are no Christians here. I'm the only one. And as soon as I thought that, I remembered, it's kind of like this in my department too. It's kind of like this in the environmental studies department. And things started to click with me there. But it wasn't really until I started to think about it a bit. I need to get this toothpaste out of the way here. Um, so I started to think about it. Oh, we'll forget that for now. Um, uh, think about it a bit more theologically about extinction. The Book of Common Prayer published over uh, 500 years ago, actually the first edition, just about 500 years ago, sorry, was one of the first places the word extinction appeared. And it came in the baptismal um, prayer. And it referred to putting out the fire, to putting out the fire of one's sins to make them extinct, that the baptism would do that, that Jesus would do that through the baptism. And extinction, to put out a light, it's a really strange scientific word. You don't expect scientists to walk around thinking that when a species disappears, that somehow they're putting out a light. But I think that when Christians talk about creation care, they're talking about extinction. They're talking about a life that was lit, that is no longer. And I think that's something that creation care is different. So part of my work is to do this, to look at the science, the ethics, and the theology of extinction, and to spend probably about half my time in the science and about half the time doing the other things. So I'm trying to follow what Paul says in Corinthians, that I become all things to all men. When I go into my scientific department and I'm talking with ecologists, they see me as an ecologist, and that's very important. But when I go to church and I speak to people like Pastor Brian over here, he sees me as a Christian, as he should, and that's important. And when I go into the Candler, sometimes they see me as a very strange person, but <laughs> they also tend to see me as an ethicist or a theologian sometimes, and that's good. And that is what I think the, I've been called to do, so I try to accomplish this in my research and in my classes. So I'm going to give you a few examples of this, a little bit of science up front, and I promise I won't dwell on it. This is a wind swath map of Hurricane Wilma. So a wind swath map is to show you where the highest intensities occurred. Wilma, if anyone knows, is a superlative hurricane. Wilma was the lowest pressure ever recorded in a storm in the Atlantic Basin ever. Um, and that was a few years ago, in 2005. It happens to be three hurricanes in the top six in 2005. It was a bad year. Rita and Katrina were the other two, which you might have heard of. But what I'm interested in is actually sea turtles. Sea turtles nest on beach, and, and when the hurricanes, of course, are really bad, they wash away the beach. And so anything that's in there, sand, trees, turtle eggs, gets washed out into the ocean. So you, as you can see, probably this year, has this worked? there you go. This year, 2004, was a really bad year. Whoops, got a little excited there. <laughs> that was a really bad year. And you can see that it really impacted the number of nests for these species of turtles. Another thing I'm interested in is this ant. Um, this was not the ant that you took off my shoulder at dinner, Brian, by the way. That was a different species. This is ant is, uh, is given the wonderfully lucid scientific name, Fidoli megacephala. And the common name for that, if you follow the Latin in megacephala, is the big-headed ant. And as you can see, it has quite a big head. Um, this is a consequence of us shipping things all over the world. This ant is pretty much everywhere, and other ants like it. It's incredibly destructive. And as you can see by this material that it has here, these massive jaws, it digs down into the sand and actually eats turtle eggs. So in addition to hurricanes, in addition to this being an increasing factor, they have these ants that are colonizing islands all over the world and digging down and eating these deer turtle nests. 
So this is some of the things that I'm working on. Another thing I'm working on, as you can see these little white dots, these are shrimp trawlers. These are shrimp uh, commercial fishing vessels that trawl the ocean to get shrimp. Now you can see they probably look like airplanes with little contrails behind them. That's actually mud from the bottom of the ocean that they're dragging up to the surface. And you can say, well, maybe that doesn't look so hot, but really how bad is it? Well, in addition to all the things that they bulldoze in order to get shrimp, they're actually not very good at getting shrimp. You can see in the hand there, this was done in Baja, California. This is only about uh, 1.2 kilos of shrimp, and there is much more than 1.2 kilos of non-shrimp in the background. It's an incredibly inefficient fishery, and what they do with all the other stuff they catch, which tends to be more than 90% by weight, is just toss it overboard. It's dead. They don't use it. So can you imagine an economic industry that is more than 90% inefficient and yet is still active in today's economy? Yet the shrimp industry goes on. So we're working on ways, I'm working actually with an Australian fisherman to reform this, ish, this fishery so it's more efficient. It catches more of what it's going for and it damages the ocean less. Another thing I'm doing is working in South Africa with the national park system. And we're trying to understand Historically, through time, how is Southern Africa managing its mammals? They have this vast system of national parks, but how good is it doing? And one of the things we've looked at is, over time, how are they maintaining this historical level of species diversity? Well, it's hard to know what the land was like in the 1700s, but thankfully, hunters went everywhere in Africa in the 16 and 1700s, so we have some good records, and we've been able to reconstruct a time series. And you can see that in spite of having one of the um, oldest and best funded per capita um, for their GDP in South Africa, national park systems in the world, they're not doing as well as you might think. And actually, if you sort of tally this up, about half of the area of Southern Africa has lost half of its species of mammals. Now this is one of the best national park systems in the world. So we can learn from some things we're doing here. So one of the things I want to talk about tonight is the various ways that Christians deal with environmentalism. You may have, in the past few years, if you're paying attention, you've seen a lot of articles about evangelicals and strange partnerships, and even the new pope, um, Benedict, his first speech he gave on, uh, he spoke about climate change, and he spoke about the deserts in the world expanding because the internal deserts in our souls have become so vast. He's talking about climate change. He's talking about the morality of climate change. You may have heard of a lot of these things, but then yet, maybe you've heard, wait a second, the Bible just says we can do whatever we want with the earth, right? We have dominion. We can do what we want. We can take it. We can use it. That's what the Bible says. Maybe that's what you've heard. Maybe you've heard that Christianity is anthropocentric. Maybe you've heard that it's uh, a license for free market capitalism. I'm not sure, but we're going to talk about what Christians think, why they think it, and maybe some responses to it that are biblical. So a few years ago, I did a survey of all the Christian denominations in the United States, what they thought about the environment. I initially thought, I did this with some of my colleagues, and we thought, hey, you know, it's going to be a simple, yes, we're on board with this, no, we're not. And it wasn't. It was a little bit more nuanced than that. So I'm going to sort of describe that. We looked at the major denominations of more than a million members. We looked at prominent individuals, folks like Pat Robertson, or um, folks like Pat Robertson. And uh, <laughs> Rick Warren was escaping me at the time. I don't know why, Rick Warren. Um, and then we also looked at uh, nonprofit agencies. Uh, Christian think tanks um, and Christian organizations um, like World Vision or something like that. And uh, so what we found, the first type we found is, of course, what we call the earth keeping. Now, these are organizations and individuals that are sort of on board with environmentalism. They have their denominations have um, laws or bylaws or perhaps even doctrines or position statements or publications, or curriculum, or Sunday school studies, or leaflets. They deal with this sort of thing and infer environmentalism. They can for a variety of reasons, but the bottom line is that they do. Um, pretty simple. You may have, this has been a lot of activity in this in the last five years. Actually, there's been a lot of things happening. Um, the Evangelical Climate Initiatives, 
ChristiansAndClimate.org, if you want to go look at that, ChristiansAndClimate.org, is, uh, was a major thing that happened. And you may think if any one of the Christian groups is going to be involved with environmentalism, it ain't going to be the evangelicals. But that actually is not true. In the past five years, it's been remarkably uh, a vibrant area of Christian environmentalism has been among evangelicals. For a short time, I was a, a speechwriter for Richard Sizik, who is the National Association of Evangelicals. He worked for them for a long time. He's now starting his own thing. Um, and he was so busy, he had to work with me to help him do some of his work because there was such a demand for him to come speak at churches. There are many organizations, nonprofits. And I'll talk about one a little bit later. Um, but there's been some interesting things happening in this too. Now, I say this is not an April Fool's joke. This is Al Sharpton and, and Pat Robertson, of course, who don't agree. Um, if you've seen this commercial on, on TV, um, they don't agree on really anything except for sitting on that couch together, I think. <laughs> and that climate change isn't important. Um, this was something done by Al Gore, was part of his project. But you can see that there is quite a bit going on, and there are some unlikely partnerships happening. That's only the tip of the iceberg. The next group we found was a pretty interesting one. Um, it was a group of skeptical Christians. Skeptical in the sense that they didn't want to be involved with environmentalism for any reason because of the so-called culture wars. So this was a cultural issue for them. It was a political issue. They were optimistic about human ingenuity. They were pessimistic about government interference. Um, and there were some, some important historical reasons for this, but this really prevented them from getting involved. Now, Southern Baptists, if you're a Southern Baptist, this is changing a little bit recently. There's been a crack in the dam, and uh, a good friend of mine is part of writing a um, creation, I wouldn't call it a creation catechism, but something very like that for the Baptists. So this is changing a little bit. This has been really focused on some cultural hot issues like Darwin. Now, this is my, fa my favorite picture of Darwin because it's so inaccurate. Um, he was not a thin man. This man is very thin. And, but the strangest part of this picture, which is from Vanity Fair in the 60s, is that it looks like he's sitting on a large chocolate cake. And I have no idea what that is. If someone could explain that to me, I'd, I'd really like that. But uh, it apparently looks like he's sitting on a large chocolate cake. I, can't, I don't have no other explanation for it. But Darwin is a big reason for this. There's a big reason for preventing some Christians from getting involved with environmentalism. As you might imagine, we're talking about the earth, nature, the environment, species. Evolution comes up. And it's a natural thing for some Christians to view as not their cup of tea. Another thing that's been very significant is just the methods of science. And this is a very obviously famous painting by Caravaggio called The Incredulity of St. Thomas or The Unbelief. Thomas gets a bad rap. There's actually several things that Thomas does in the New Testament, particularly in the book of John, that are fascinating. Um, he's a very devoted, he's a very faithful person. And the question that he asked Jesus in John 14 gives us, there is no way to the Father but through me. John 14, 6. So Thomas is seen as a negative. If you ask questions, that's not a good thing. But look at Jesus' hand here. He's holding Thomas' hand. He's pointing it, and this the way that Caravaggio has depicted it, thrusting it into his wound, not just pointing to it, not just revealing it, but he's rewarding Thomas' question. Thomas asked Jesus, the other question in John 14, but he asked him another question before, and Jesus always answers him. I think that's important, but it gives science this sort of idea and this asking questions, this digging deep, is something that Christians shouldn't do. If science is looking for a patron saint, it's Thomas. Not that they're asking for one. But this gives us a few important paradoxes with the skeptics. One, they're very optimistic about human capability and technology, but they're anti-science. So how do you get technology without science? I still haven't gotten the answer to that one. And then they tend to be 
very focused on free market capitalism and having, not having interference from government control, but yet they're anti-Darwin. So how do you get the survival of the fittest in a social and economic arena if you don't have a sci survival of the fittest biologically? How can you have something that's socially true but not biologically true? It's possible you could make that argument, but I just think it's tough. So how can you be pro-technology yet anti-science? How can you be for free market capitalism and survival of the fittest and yet not believe it biologically? I think you have some problems there. So the next group we saw, uh -huh, this one. Okay, this is a great example of the skeptics. This is a senator from Oklahoma, Jen Inhofe, very outspoken evangelical. And you can see here that he's at a press conference and he's not entertaining questions from the polar bear because he doesn't believe in climate change. So he's ignoring it. So there's a funny sidebar with this image too, is that the polar bear is having quite a dinner there and uh, of a chicken sandwich and a lot of fried potatoes it looks like. But the only thing that they seem to have in common with Jim Inhofe is that they both take lemon in their water. Um, <laughs> but this brings us to an important point. Blaise Pascal made a famous wager he proposed to, for someone to try out faith if they're agnostic or if they're an atheist. He said, you must choose, you must wager if God exists or if he doesn't. But if you wager that he does, and you live a good life, and you die, and it ends up he doesn't exist, you've gained everything and you've lost nothing. But if you wager that he doesn't exist, and you live your life the way you want, and you die, and he does exist, well then you've lost everything. There's a very similar argument to be made here for the skeptics with regard to environmentalism. If you believe that there are problems with our earth right now, and that we are causing them, and that we can do something about it, and you accept the data, and you accept the scientist's word, and you accept the theology and the ethicists who talk about this, and you get involved and you live your life as if it matters, and you die and it's not true, what have you lost? But if you live your life the other way, as if there's nothing wrong with our planet, as if everything's okay, as if there's plenty of food, as if forests are plentiful, as if the air is great, and then you die, and that ends up not being true, well, then I think you've lost quite a great deal. We don't have anything significantly at stake as people and as Christians by saying there's something wrong with our planet and we can do something about it. So the next group is what we call the priority group. Now, this is a bit more intellectual. They focus a bit more on the theology. They tend to be rather anthropocentric in that and that the focus is more on salvation of humans. Now, you can see how this may not pan out very well for environmentalism. Um, they often talk about the environment being important, but not enough that it would actually translate into laws or action, because there are many other things that we need to focus on, like translating the Bible into every language that exists, so the rapture will ensue. No, I'm not, I'm not, saying, I'm not saying that pejoratively, I'm just, that is a stated purpose of Pentecostal faiths and others. So my response to that is, have you ever read the book of Job? The book of Job is a book that Emily Dickens said when she finished reading it said, I don't think God comes out that well. She was not a Christian. Um, but the book is a long struggle between someone who has gone through extreme personal agony and at the end, he's counseled by some friends that don't give him the best advice. And at the end, God shows up, and he doesn't directly answer some of the things that they've been talking about for many chapters. What he says is, have you ever seen a zebra? Have you, seen, have you ever really considered an eagle or a hippo or an alligator? Have you seen an ostrich run? By the way, a wild donkey is a zebra. Now, this is something that might be painful for, for some of you, but uh, I don't say this because I'm a Florida fan. I'm actually not. But uh, Tim Tebow is very well known for his, uh, for his uh, reflective tape under his eyes. And John 3.16 is something we probably all know very well. For God so loved the world that he sent his son, that whoever who would believe in him would have eternal life. For God so loved the world is for God so loved the cosmos. 
for God so loved the cosmos. Now, John, the Apostle John, who writes this part of the gospel, he uses that word world a lot and in many different ways. But for here, God so loved the world that he gave his son. God became a person because he loved the world. Not because the world was inherently bad or because we needed to run it to exhaustion. This is uh, some statistics from the uh, U.S. Department of Agriculture of the per capita food consumption over the past 25 years in the United States. So it's per capita, so it's normalized for population. But you can see those trends are going up. It begins in 1980, ends in 2006, I believe. And what you can see there is no matter, and those texts might be kind of small for you there, but we're eating a lot more than we used to. Um, I remember 1980, it wasn't bad, and yet we're eating almost like a few more days a week is what it's like. It's like we're eating for Sunday on Saturday as well as eating for Saturday. We're eating a lot more than we used to. And of course, the result is that our society has an obesity problem. We have a diabetes problem. Most people in med school right now are thinking, I need to go internal medicine because that's where the demand is um, to deal with obesity and diabetes. So we have a huge problem with consumption. The priority, the theology that focuses on the salvation of humans ignores this love that God has for his creation, for the earth. It focuses, and it even, I would say, baptizes this kind of consumption without limit. We need to have limits on this. It's good for us. Now, this is something that I'm going to be seeing very soon. This is the Honolulu fish market auction, where the commercial fishermen bring in their swordfish and tuna and where it's priced, and that is uh, set for that catch and, I think, for that season. Um, there's something about this statement that's rather sobering. 90% of the seafood in the next 40 years will be extinct. It's almost like it's, it's hard to believe. It's incredible, right? I can't believe that in 40 years there won't be swordfish. Well, you don't even really have to listen or believe that. You can just look at the swordfish over here. These are actually not a different species. Those are still swordfish. They're just really small because that's really most of what's left as the really small individuals because they can't grow to be 70, 80 years old because they're being caught. So this kind of attitude says that a swordfish in the belly or in Kroger or at Whole Foods is worth more somehow to us than one swimming in the sea. So the last one we, we found was a group that was really focused on other issues and didn't talk about environmentalism whatsoever. They were more focused on social justice. Now this tended to be the historically African American denominations and there's actually something very interesting there when you look at historically African American denominations and their political structure and their political involvement. It's not what you might think. And if you're interested in that, I can point you to some readings um, about this. But this is very interesting to me because there's a deep link between ecological destruction and human oppression. When you find social injustice in human communities, you find ecological destruction. They're inexorably linked. And this happens in a lot of ways, one of which is an example from the Bible we have of the cedars of Lebanon. The cedars of Lebanon were a symbol in the Old Testament of righteousness, beauty, strength, stateliness, majesty, and whoever controlled the cedars of Lebanon controlled something vast and, and powerful and wealthy because from these cedars were the makings of empire, were ships, were castles, were warships. This was how things were done. The Egyptians used the resin to embalm their, their dead ones. They used it for medicine. And of course, um, these don't really exist in the way that they used to. It's almost hard to imagine how much they've gone. This is an image, a satellite image, actually a composite of about 100 satellite images. Uh, in Lebanon, you're looking from north to south, 
And in case you can't see it, here's a mountain range right here. That snow-capped peak at the end is Mount Hermon on the border of Syria and just to the south, uh, Israel. And then we have right here Mount Lebanon. This whole valley, you can see between these two mountain ranges, between the one with Mount Hermon and between Mount Lebanon, used to be entirely green. It used to be the cedars of Lebanon, but now it's pretty much bare dirt. There is some agriculture there. You can see some green patches here and there. And you can see on the far, if you're really looking, I'd be impressed, there are some cedars right here on these slopes. Here's the ocean off to the, to the right there. But the idea is that Israel is largely to blame for this, the nation of Israel, and in particular Solomon. Solomon doesn't fare well when it comes to ecological um, testimony. Solomon was one of the first kings of Israel, and, and in his use of the cedars of Lebanon, turned a covenantal theocracy, a society which was a covenant in God, with God, to an imperial monarchy. And you may say, well, is that a stretch? Well, he enslaved his own people to cut them down, which was against the covenant that Israel had with God. He enslaved his own people to cut down the cedars of Lebanon and to build the temple of all things, the temple of God from the cedars of Lebanon. What was righteous and beautiful and full of strength and was a symbol of majesty, he, he cut them all down. Um, there's a great study that you can look on this. Um, another example, um, and of course, uh, Zechariah says it best, you know, wailing for the, cypress, for the cypress and for the cedars that have fallen. So my own experience in the Amazon where poverty and where injustices happen, um, you can see that this village probably isn't the safest place to live in a torrential downpour. This is outside on the outskirts of a town named Manaus um, where I did my dissertation research. Um, this is a place that almost the identical photograph was taken for a medical textbook where tropical parasites run amok because the water is not sanitized and there's things like cholera and leishmaniasis and schistomiasis and all sorts of nasty parasites that you can get. Incidentally, that's not where I got mine. Um, but you can see that these kids are just playing in there. And I took this picture of these kids. They just kind of seemed like normal kids. Um, the picture in the middle, the girl in the middle just struck me for her poise and her smile amidst this just outright squalor. But places where there are complete deforestation, where there are political oppression is also, um, those are linked. One last one here. Um, you might think this is an odd word for that picture, but this is a smoke flower in the tall grass prairie here in the US. Now the tall grass prairie was 99.9% .9 destroyed in the US. It's since made a recovery. And of course, with the destruction of the tall grass prairie were the people who depended on that, the Native Americans, those tribes. This story has happened throughout the world. When ecosystems are annihilated, the people that live there are destroyed. A good example to think of is linguistic diversity. You look at the number of languages in the world right now, we're at about 6,500, almost 7,000, a little bit less. And in the next century, we're anticipated to lose over 6,000 6, of those languages, more than 90%. Now, why is that? Is it because they're all leaving their small villages and they're moving to Tokyo and Rio de Janeiro and Mexico City and Bangkok? Or is it because the forests where they call home are being cut down? Well, it's both. But the reality is that you cannot separate you cannot say, we must care about humans. The church calls us to care about humans. The Bible demands salvation of people and ignore the environment. We live on this earth. We have to save these things. Now, to give you one more, one more example about the, uh, the smoke flower, 99.9% .9 of the tall grass prairie was destroyed, but it's made a comeback, I said. Well, where do you think they went to get the seeds for those species, because they didn't exist anywhere. They couldn't have gone to Home Depot and said, I'd like some smoke flower seeds, please. They don't exist there. Where do you think they got the seed bank to repopulate it? I think it's now back to about 5%. Nothing to do backflips about, but it's a good start. They went to the only places that weren't plowed, cemeteries and churchyards. If it weren't for churches, we might not have any tall grass prairie today, at least not 5%. So what does the Bible say? 
Well, there are a few important things that I want to talk about out of the scriptures. And there are the two important passages in Genesis. Now, this f- passage from the first chapter is something very important, and it is the dominion passage. Now, you can see that I didn't put dominion there. I put the original word uh, that was the Bible was written, at least the Old Testament, was in Hebrew. And this word radah is where we get dominion from. But dominion is not the dominion you probably are thinking of, or may, maybe not the easy one that you'd like. Um, this passage says, let, them make, let us make men and women like us, and let them do work like us. The image of God, what theologians call the imago Dei, comes before the assignment of dominion. There's a link between being like God in image and being like God in work. Dominion in this way is what Brian mentioned earlier, co-creation. God calling us to be creators alongside him. Now this, is a, this word is often translated, and this is a slide you saw at the beginning, so if you've been, not been paying attention, this is going to be on the final exam. Uh, these are two butterflies. If you haven't seen them before, you say orange butterfly. It's a monarch, right? Well, this word rada actually means vice regent. Technically, it's often how it's translated, or representative of the king. And so I like to use this as an illustrative example. The monarch, these are actually different butterflies, but they look awfully similar. That's the idea. This is the monarch. It's called the king, and the one on the other side is the viceroy. It's the representative of the king. In ecology, we call this mimicry, right? Dominion is mimicry. It is us, the viceroy, mimicking the monarch, the king. So if you remember nothing else, when you see an orange butterfly, think of Genesis 1. Secondly, the second passage, uh, second chapter of Genesis This is sometimes translated, I believe the King James even translates it as to plow and to use the earth. Uh, Again, let's go to the Hebrew here. And I want to use, look at other places where these words are used to, to sort of suss out their meaning. So abad, if we look at it elsewhere, choose this day whom you will serve. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. That's abad. Shamar is a little different. It doesn't have this service component. It's more of something that's very tender and gentle and loving. It's to exercise great care over. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord shine his face on you and favor you. Uh, May he lift his countenance on you and give you peace. So if you put these back in Genesis 2.15, knowing how they're used elsewhere in a very favorable and a very positive way, Then you get, the Lord God took the man to put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and to keep it. But even that doesn't really capture the meaning of those words. The idea is that when you look at how it's originally written in the Hebrew, I don't know how from this you can get a mandate to fish the seas until they're empty, to cut down a forest until there's nothing there, to turn it into a desert, to plow and to use something to exhaustion to annihilate native peoples for economic gain or for university research or for the imperial projects of a nation state. I don't know how you get that out of Genesis 2.15. I think you're not doing theology. So I mentioned that there is some work that we need to do in the church And I think those are three main areas we need to do work theologically and practically. The first one is Christology. The second one is ecclesiology. And the last one is eschatology. So those are some academic words for you, but let me tell you what they mean. Christology, you might imagine, is about Jesus. And you'd be right. This is the image that most of us have of the creation. And this is called the moment of creation sometimes. This is Michelangelo's work on the Sistine Chapel, of course. And you can see that that picture of that creator looks like, at least for the longest time, that's the image of creation that I had in my head, even though I may not have gotten it from this. It's just the image I had. But the Bible actually talks about, at least the New Testament, the Christian language of the New Testament is that Jesus is the creator. 
It's not the Father of the Trinity. It's not the first person of the Trinity. It's the second person of the Trinity. As Christians, creation is about Jesus. First chapter of the Gospel of John. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, and the Word was with God. All things came into being through him. That's Jesus. The first chapter of Colossians. Nothing came into being that did not come into being through Jesus. That's different than how I was taught growing up. What does it mean for us as Christians to do creation care, knowing that creation was brought into being and is sustained by Jesus himself? This is what Colossians says. It's not the first person, the inaccessible, the hard to understand, the hard to know, God the Father, the white-haired man in the cloud. It's Jesus who was revealed to us. Christianity is about Christ. Creation is about Christ. Ecclesiology. We need to do a better job of Christians at micropolitics. This work needs to be the work of the church. This needs to be something that doesn't just happen on Sunday, but happens Monday through Saturday. And the, you know who's really good at this are the Anabaptists, the Amish. They may be easy to sort of poke fun at because they don't have iPhones, and they ride around in horse and buggy, but they practice micropolitics like no other denomination of Christians. The church needs to understand and needs to work on what does it mean for the church to practice environmentalism at the local church level not relying on the Endangered Species Act, not relying on the Clean Air Act, not relying on the UN Kyoto Protocol, but relying on your pastor and your congregation and your fellowship and your friends. You in the church is where this needs to be done. Don't wait for the nation state to do it for you. Don't wait for the corporations to do it for you. Don't wait for GM, that probably won't happen, by the way. You need to do it yourself in the church. And lastly, eschatology. N.T. Wright spoke here uh, last time, and when my wife found out that I was speaking, um, following N.T. Wright, she said, I'm sorry for you. <laughs> That's not a joke. And then she said, oh, what a great joy, though. I didn't think this really went together. But, uh, but N.T. Wright um, is on to something when he talks about the new creation and the work of Jesus in history. This is eschatology, the resurrection. What does it mean that all of creation, not just us, the cosmos is suffering? The cosmos is suffering and in some way will be restored. Does this mean, the scripture says in Isaiah, that the lion will lie down with the lamb? Does that mean also that the Tyrannosaurus rex will lie down with the dodo bird? two extinct species? Does it mean that the Neanderthal will eat straw alongside the Mastodon? I don't know. But those are interesting questions. I think the resurrection, I didn't think they were funny questions, I thought they were interesting questions. But um, we do know one thing. Those are Darwin's finches that it does in a very similar passage where it talks about the lion lying down with the lamb, it talks about the cedars rejoicing because their tormentors are no longer there, that the Lord has taken them away. So if we don't know about the mastodon or the tyrannosaur or the dodo, we don't, what does the resurrection mean for them? We do know that the cedars of Lebanon will rejoice, and Isaiah says they will clap their hands. I think that's something to look forward to. So I have a few more things that I asked in the beginning, and that was about good work and where to do it. And this is going to be the last thing I say. But the temptation sometimes when you get motivated about justice or the environment is perhaps you get into the theology and you want to go to divinity school and become a pastor. That's OK. Perhaps you want to go to graduate school and become a professor. That's OK. Perhaps you want to go into corporate. That's OK. The idea is that you would pursue good work in such a way that it's where your deep joy meets the deep needs of the world, as Friedrich Buechner said it. Where your deep joy meets the deep needs of the world. So, and lastly, I will say, whom are your co-workers? Do you work with an atheist? 
I would say absolutely. If your determinative, constitutive tradition to which you belong that names your life and your work, whether that's ecologist or Christian or Baptist or English major or pre-med or Jackson, if that's your last name, whatever is most distinctive about your life, most constitutive about who you are and what you do, um, working with the enemy and loving the enemy is something that the Bible calls us to do. Now, I don't consider Ed Wilson my enemy. Ed Wilson is a very famous ecologist whom we've started to work together with on some ant work, even though he knows I'm an evangelical and he knows that, um, that I care about an orthodox reading of the Bible. Um, he knows that I also care about ants, and he knows that I care about um, conservation biology, and so we're working together on this. I think this is important. We need to have a distinctive voice as Christians that is based out of our local church, that is based in that micro-political life. But absolutely, we need to be working in the broader society with people who may even be atheists, who may even say Darwin is the most important person that has ever lived, which is what Ed Wilson said when he came here a few months ago. We need to work um, with these people and be the friend to the enemy. Thank you very much. so people don't have to come so far down, and we'll move this up a little bit. We'll have a little bit more of a coffee house feel. <laughs> Without the coffee. Yeah. No. So I think it probably would work best if you have a question. You'd come down to a microphone, or you can probably just shout it out from where you are. Do you have a question, Pat? I do. We want to record it. So. Okay, we want to record it, so please uh, go up to the microphone, Pat. And also, if you have cards, uh, ushers, can you grab those and uh, bring them up to us? Hey, Kyle. How you doing? Good. Thanks for coming. <coughs> Thanks for the great talk. This isn't terribly relevant, but uh, the, um, the Times Magazine had a cover story this week on Freeman Dyson, physicist. Yes. And he's come out, I guess, against or at least skeptical of global, global warming, et cetera. And uh, just wondered what you thought about that and what your response is. Well, uh, the, uh, I haven't done my homework. I haven't read the, the Dyson article. He's, uh, um, I think uh, Dyson's a provocative person because he is, uh, it's murky in that article, I understand, about his religious commitment. But I understand he's an Anglican. And that's a pretty important part of his life. But he's also an experimental physicist. He has come out as saying that uh, global warming, uh, that the temperature, I think he's said that the temperature may be increasing, but it's not our fault. That, that an excess of carbon in the atmosphere to this level would not cause that. Uh, I have not, the debate right now in climate change is not generally whether it's getting hotter. That debate has mostly been, I think, solved, although, it, of course, it's science. It still goes on. But um, the question is, what's causing it? And I think that he's come out and is saying that it's not us. It's not our carbon. I, I haven't read the article. Um, all I could say is that, you know, um, he's a very smart man. And he's won some s significant awards, and he's done some a pretty heady theory in his life. Uh, but I, I don't know what his basis for making that claim is. My understanding of the people that I'm close to have done more work on understanding the temperature signatures and how they've changed over time. A slide I showed you in the beginning of Hawaii was a, temp was a um, precipitation signature. It's, it's just basically plummeting. They're getting a lot less rain than they used to in Hawaii, which is a big deal um, because it's a very, the islands are very small. And when things change drastically, uh, the ecosystems can't migrate. They'd move into the ocean, right? So um, I don't know specifically about the Freeman Dyson bit, but. Um, the, the data that I've seen and the arguments that I've seen about climate forcing 
and the temperature going up and our, the carbon in the atmosphere, or at least the greenhouse gases causing that is, is pretty overwhelmingly significant from what I've seen. What was, um, we can talk about that later though. Um, I was wondering if you could tell us how you got your flesh-eating disease. <laughs> well, the answer, the, the strictly technical answer is I was wearing socks that were not long enough. So I was uh, wearing some um, uh, $1.99 Nike uh, tube socks that I got from uh, Marshalls. And I should have been wearing knee highs because I got bit uh, in the evening at night by a nocturnal sand fly and it gave me a protozoa, which is kind of uh, half malaria, half um, leprosy, I guess. And it sort of eats your flesh away and it does some nasty things. So I was out at night wearing socks that were too short. <laughs> uh, yeah, I had a question. Um, when talking about the palliation of the extinction, extinction crisis, um, are we not ourselves agents of selective pressure in the ongoing evolutionary process? Uh, where do we draw the line between interfering in extinction and letting extinction be a part of evolution that has shaped us if the bacteria that converted the atmosphere to oxygen before we came around were, uh, had a consciousness and thought that was a global crisis for them mm -hmm. and stopped that from happening somehow, which is kind of an odd thing to say. How is it different from us trying to stop the atmosphere from changing? Are we more consequential to be able to interfere in all these things when we are just uh, an end result of the same process we're trying to stop, perhaps? That's a great question. Uh, there, the answer is a kind of three part. Uh, the first part is the time scales of evolutionary change are entirely different. So the time scale of us changing the, the, the systems on this earth are six orders of magnitude more rapid than anything that the bacteria did. So the changes that we are making on our planet right now and the extinctions that are predicted from that in the next century will take 500 times longer to recover than humans have been on this planet. Now that's by a scientific estimate. That's not the 6,000 years from a literal creationist ex um, estimate of human life. So we're talking that if everything that is go we think will go extinct at the end of the century and humans disappeared in the year 2100, it would take uh, 1.5 million years to recover. So, no, I'm sorry, 5 million years to recover. So this first is a time scale issue. We're causing a rate of change much faster than the bacteria did that made a favorable change so that we could inhabit this planet from an evolutionary story. The second thing about how evolution works in, in our species is very different now from how evolution works from most other species. And that is the selection, which you mentioned, on humans is at mostly right now the brain level. Where selection, natural selection is working on us is not in our fingernails. Why do we have fingernails? It doesn't help us at the computer, you know? It doesn't help us with a lot of things, maybe scratching your friend's back. But it's not that useful in an evolutionary sense. Where the changes that are occurring in humans is occurring at the brain level, mostly, and the modifications we're making to our environment. And then, uh, lastly, I had something that I've kind of forgotten what I was going to say there. But the, uh, as far as the consciousness and the right, we're very aware, unlike the bacteria, of what we're doing. Okay? We are an ethical species. We may not be the only ethical species, some argue. Uh, that's a kind of mixed debate. But we are aware of the changes that we're making, and we're aware of the impact. It's just whether we're going to do something about it. Looking at, uh, it's in the news recently, there's this Christian movement, the Quiverful movement, where Christians are having 10, 15, 20 kids. So the question is, is there, is, is the, is there such thing as overpopulation, or is it distribution of resources on the promise? Uh, on the, or is the problem distribution of resources, and what is the biblical perspective on uh, overpopulation? That's a, that's a very good question. My master's advisor was Paul Ehrlich. If you know who that is, he wrote The Population Bomb. So he wrote the book in 1968, which came up with the idea 
of zero population growth. Obviously, we use a lot of resources. Has anyone ever done a, a, a carbon footprint for themselves to understand how many planets would it take to support the entire humanity if everyone behaved like you did on this planet? <laughs> so Max, how many planets would it take to support us based on your carbon footprint? 27, so that's a lot of planets. More than are in this solar system, by the way. Um, that is just a, it is a problem that we have to deal with. Um, I don't, my wife does not want to have 10 or 15 kids. And, um, and I think she and I are both thankful for that. I, I, um, I personally just don't know how, um, how that would, uh, how to support a family of 15. It kind of scares me. Um, based on my paycheck. But uh, I would say that what does the Bible say about this? Well, the Bible obviously says, talks to um, Abraham and to Adam to fill the earth, right? Uh, I think that we could probably generally say that that's something that does not need to happen right now, that that has already happened. So we have completed that mission. Um, I, I think that there are ways to have, if you say, I, I want to have six kids, um, I think that there are ways to reduce the impact that you have on the planet that would make that um, more green, if you want to call it that way. Um, and there are a lot of things like you can do, like use all the toothpaste in your tube, for one, um, which I've already showed you how to do. So, um, but you know, one thing that has come up a lot in the churches that I've been involved with um, is adoption. And there are a lot of children in this world that do not have parents and would really like them. And what I've seen happen a lot is uh, for families, infertility is also a massive problem. And I think that is more of a reality than plus five kids for family. Um, infertility is an environmental disease. Um, if you look at, uh, to, to be very frank biologically, the sperm count, the, the viable sperm count for an average male in modern industrialized areas, I think is a hundred to a thousand times less than it was maybe 50, 100 years ago. That's significant. That's our body saying, you're too sick to breed. You're not healthy enough. If you, if you were to toss your body into a landfill, you would get fined because it's too toxic. I'm not kidding. There is more heavy metals, arsenic, manganese, lead, mercury, especially if you're eating swordfish, in your body that you actually can't throw yourself away. It's against the law. Now that is, I think, more of a problem for our society than people having a lot of children. But I could say that adoption is a wonderful thing. Theologically, it's what Jesus did to us. And it's something that is a very transformative power on church communities. Well, we have a, a question. It begins with a comment saying, personally, I'd rather live in a world full of sea turtles than uh, big-headed ants. However, what makes the sea turtle populations more valuable than the ant population? Or in other words, should we protect animals who are facing extinction due to human footprint, or should we protect all animals from extinction regardless of whether or not humans were a factor? That's a great question. Uh, um, environmental philosophy really deals with this. Sometimes this is called speciesism, so sort of like the idea of racism but mapped onto species. So you just like turtles, you're just, uh, you're, you like reptiles, maybe you like amphibians or birds and you don't like anything else and, and that's, a, a f that's a problem, you know, that's a pathology. Um, I think um, the, this, the quick and simple answer is that the ant was brought there by us. It did not get itself there. So we assisted that movement. So that would be, in evolutionary terms, artificial selection, right? That would not be natural selection. So we are interfering in the natural process, right? This has happened a lot, right? There have been a lot of things that we've done like this. It's not just the ant. So, does the, so that's the question of, from an environmental management perspective, that's what the U.S. government says. The U.S. government says, okay, this is the Dry Tortugas National Parks. I know there were no ants here 100 years ago. Actually, there were because there was a lab there. But maybe 200 years ago, there weren't any ants there. Um, and we need to save sea turtles. That's what the Endangered Species Act tells us to do. So from a legal governmental policy framework, we must, we are legally bound to save sea turtles and eradicate anything that gets in the way, including the African big-headed ant. Uh, fire ants also a problem out there. 
Um, but does the ant have the same rights that a sea turtle does? Now that is a thornier issue. That's a thornier issue. Philosophically, there are many philosophers that would say absolutely the same right. You cannot distinguish between a sea turtle, an ant, a human infant, or a hippo. Equal. There are some philosophers that say that. I'm not one of them. Um, but I, I think that preserving the ecological integrity as much as possible in the place that exists is, is, is legally, um, philosophically, is that's the way to go. Well, we have a question here. How does an average Christian community weigh the importance of environmental concern as compared to the relational and social concerns, assuming that there is a very limited amount of time any particular community has to give to worthy causes? Is it possible to blend these concerns? Well, yeah, you can't do everything, right? You can't do everything. You can't perhaps have a big project and program to feed the homeless and then also to compose jazz and then to have um, some amazing uh, outreach in the university and then also to plant trees. Um, you may think that, but a congregation is composed of many people with many talents. And I would say that if you mine the talents of that congregation, there are many things that you could do. If you just employed the church staff, you're going to be doing very little. You have to employ everyone that's there. And I think that's the, actually the Pauline vision. What Paul gives in Corinthians as describing the church body is eyes and ears and hands. It's not just teachers. It's not just uh, prophets. People have to cook food. People have to be hospitable. People have, there have to be artists. There have to be teachers, too. But if you employ all the talents of your congregation, I think that's a wealthy resource. So I think you can do more than you may think you can. All right. But question, how can we encourage other Christians to engage the environmental protection movement with the spirit of cooperation? Do you think that this can be a ground for interfaith work? Interfaith and between faith and non-faith. It's happening right now. There is a consortium of atheists and agnostic scientists, Jews and Christians, evangelicals and otherwise, that are working together. I haven't seen um, many products from those. They've gotten together. They said, hey, you're okay. I'm okay. It's good. But there hasn't the second stage from that. So they said, I will work with you but I don't know what the work that has been done. I think that this really needs to happen on a personal level. I think that you need to do this. I think that you need to be the personal bridge that walks between the laboratory and the sanctuary. I think that that needs to happen by everyday people, not saying, oh, I'm a Christian and you're not a Christian and let's talk about the environment. I think you just need to do that work every day in your life. It doesn't need to be a special thing. There are special events and there's stuff happening but it's mostly on a leadership level, and it hasn't transcended down to the local level of things taking place. We have microphones open, and I'm sure that there are more questions that, that you all have. And so now is the time to be brave and ask them, mm -hmm. because we can't make change if we That's right. aren't brave enough to approach the mic. Yeah? Hi. How you doing? Good. How are you? I'm good. Good. Um, just curious, um, what do you see as like the most um, applicable and immediately urgent or easy way for an everyday student or person to incorporate changes into their life that can help to improve the environment? Well, a very easy way is with your pocketbook. Um, I can tell you, as soon as you start making your own budget, you can realize that food is expensive and that driving your car is expensive. And uh, I'd say one of the most important ecological decisions you can make is live your life in a local place. Live near where you work. Go to church near where you live. Um, shop near where you live. Try to buy food that's grown in your state, if that's possible. You won't be eating mangoes, maybe, at least not all the time. Um, I will, by the way, because I'm moving to Hawaii. Uh, <laughs> right. Incidentally... Incidentally, when I told one of my good friends I was moving to Hawaii, he said, you know how expensive it is there? Do you know how much orange juice costs in Hawaii? And I said, you know, if I'm in Hawaii, I don't think I'm going to be eating oranges. Uh, I think I'm going to be eating papayas and mangoes and coconuts and passion fruit. But, um, 
But the uh, the main thing I think is really is how you spend your money. And you know, there used to be this course that was taught called home economics, right? Do you remember this course? Maybe you had it in high school. I vaguely remember mine, and we were basically taught to sew and to make a few desserts. The desserts were not very elaborate. It was like pudding, so it was like instant pudding. Um, but home economics, the word economics is actually a very profound word. It was coined by Aristotle, and it's, it is the, um, the law of the home, the oikos nomos. Ecology is a very similar word. It's oikos logos. It's the workings of the home. And what we call the church, or the, the oikonomini, or what you get ecumenical, ecumenical from, is also about oikos, and they all mean home. So these things are all related. Um, economics, ecology, the church. I think that it, the number one decision that you can make is how you spend your money. Um, with churches, I'm a part of a nonprofit that advises churches um, gives them essentially energy audits, okay? And they go into a church and they say, okay, pastor, you're spending 38% of your annual budget on heating and cooling this facility. Wouldn't you like to spend 10%? Because that would give you 28% of your budget that's freed up to spend on missions or a program or a soup kitchen that you don't have or an education program in the evening for people who just who need to get their GED. Or you can do all sorts of things with that. How do you want to spend your money? Do you want to spend it on gas? Do you want to spend it on beef? Or do you want to spend it on heating your house? Or do you want to spend it on something that's maybe a bit longer lasting than that? First thing, how you spend your money. Yes, ma'am. I, I don't have a question but a comment. Um, I'm, I'm one of those skeptics. And I, ultimately, I think my, the bottom line for me is that much of the problems that you brought forth in your talk, the bottom line is that this is sin. And the only solution for sin is the cross of Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. We can't work our way out of this and find human problems. We, those are Band-Aids and they are temporary. They make us feel good in our flesh. But they do not deal with our sinful hearts. I mean, those species of swordfish that are going extinct, that will be extinct by 2050 and everything else, I, but I, that's what I, I found missing in, in what you were talking about is that, I mean, I've heard a lot about what we can do and I think it's all very superficial and until we bow the knee and confess with our tongue the actual truth of who is Lord of Lord and King of Kings, we're spinning our wheels. This will continue, but it ultimately will stop because Jesus Christ is returning to take up his throne in Jerusalem. I know I'm sounding like a real wing nut here. <laughs> no, I appreciate you saying that. But I mean, I, <laughs> I appreciate you saying that. This is, I'm, I'm being very reductionistic, but that is absolutely what it boils down to. I think I absolutely agree with you that the resurrection is the most important thing that has ever happened. And that is a primary motivation for me in my work as an ecologist, and that Jesus fed the poor, even though he knew he was going to die, even though he knew that his resurrection would ultimately address their pain. He still fed the poor. He still healed the sick. And even though the swordfish may go extinct in 40 years, I'm still going to work to prevent that from happening because of the resurrection, not in spite of it, not forgetting it, but because of it, okay? Without a doubt. I'm not saying that, it's, that we shouldn't do anything, but I think that we've got to keep this primary in our, and in our focus. I think there Otherwise, are a lot of people who, would, who agree with you who are on the front lines doing I, battle. And I had one other comment, and that is that <laughs> I, I don't agree with your premise that we, the, the earth is overpopulated with people, and I, I talked with your <laughs> with friend or colleague earlier, and so he already knows my bias. I, we, <laughs> we met, I, I'm a nurse midwife, mm -hmm. and I believe that we are in the middle of a demographic winter, <laughs> and we need more people. <laughs> they're, they're definitely... Like, I'm, I'm very honest with my bias here. I'm wearing it for you to see quite openly. <laughs> no, I appreciate that. I mean, there's definitely demographic trends across um, across 
our country and across other countries are very inconsistent. In Europe, the population is, is what people call a demographic winter. Um, it, any population increases or mild decreases aren't worse than mild decreases because of immigration from sub-equatorial nations, mostly. And I would agree with you there. The question that is difficult to reconcile about the biblical mandate for population increase that we see in the Old Testament and the situation that we are now in environmental destruction is agriculture. And the providing food for 15, 20 billion people, we're actually barely able to do it right now. Absolutely, I agree with you, and that's, that's why I spent some time talking about the relationship between ecological destruction and political oppression. I think that's a very powerful relationship that I've seen in my own life in places like Korea. I've been to South Korea, I have not been to North Korea, in China, in Thailand, in Brazil, in Peru, in Australia. I've seen, I've been to all these places and I've seen this. Now, I can tell you right now that over the next from all the projections that I've seen, the agricultural produce is going down. It's going down. It's not going up. And you could say, well, we just need to have better seeds. We need to have GMO. We need to have genetically modified cows. We need to clone sheep. We need to invest more R&D. I'm not saying that we need to cap population. There definitely are environmentalists who say that. I'm not one of them. And there is an infrastructure problem, there's a political problem, there's a distribution problem, but there is a limit on how much this earth can produce as far as food. If you're calling Kim Jong Il a sinner, you're not going to have too many people disagreeing with you. Um, I'm calling myself a sinner. And I, absolutely. I think this is good. That's our last question. I think we're going to move out to the dessert time right now. So let's keep talking. But thank you for all your questions, everyone, and thanks for coming. Appreciate it. For more information about the Veritas Forum, including additional recordings and a calendar of upcoming events, please visit our website at veritas.org.